here we go. Welcome everybody. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna here at Clear Chiropractic in Spokane, Washington. Today we're going to be talking about vertigo and the trigeminal nerve, which are actually two very different nerves as part of the brainstem. This is a follow-up video from a question that came out through social media. The question right here. My ORL doctor said that I lost my listening at 80% and due to problems with my inner ear, I have vertigo. My chiropractor said that this comes from the jaw and the trigeminal problem. Your opinion, please. And this is a, a really, really good question. And this is something where it honestly, it takes a very, very deep dive because there are a lot of moving pieces that go into these kinds of questions here. And so a quick answer, unfortunately, I don't have it per se. But I know that if you have this one question, odds are other people do as well. So we're going to have a little look at some of the structures that can be involved and kind of help you navigate through some of the roadmaps here. So if you haven't already done so, I'll ask you if you can click that like and subscribe button. That way it helps other people who are looking for this kind of information be able to find it. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into this right away. Okay, the first thing that I need to do is kind of break things apart into a few categories because as I said, we are dealing with a couple of different uh, st structures involved here. So first and foremost, you might be wondering, what's an ORL doctor? An ORL is a specialist. It stands for Odo Rhino Laryngologist. What this is, is this is a special ENT who focuses with the inner ear, who focuses with the nose, the sinuses, and also the, the back of the throat. And we can appreciate that if we're having different kinds of head, throat, nose, inner ear kinds of issues, this is somebody who really, really knows their stuff. Now, what we'd be talking about first in this category is where you're dealing with overt pathologies, where you have damage to the different structures that would be involved. So when it relates first to damage of structures of the, the inner ear, of the brainstem itself, this is something that can usually be detected first and foremost by an audiologist. A few very simple tests, you find out if you're dealing with what's known as a sensory neural hearing loss. This is something that can happen if a person has been exposed to chronic or even sudden loud noises. You work at an airport, you loved heavy music back in the day, like me, or you are a police officer, you're near firearms a lot, things like that that can actually damage the neural structures themselves. If not the neural structures, perhaps the bone, perhaps the membrane of the inner ear, all of these different kinds of things. This can usually be detected by doing a series of physical exams, also a few cursory neurological assessments as well, to find out if there's something that's going on in this category. Now, in certain circumstances, a person could have an issue with one of the blood vessels deep inside of the brain. It's also possible that they may have a lesion, tumor, an infection, something like that, and that's what's responsible for this phenomenon going on. This is where the ENT is going to do something along the lines of an MRI because if you're dealing with overt pathology then it's very possible that okay this is a, a sinister kind of thing and you need to go down the medical the surgical route in that particular case but as often as the case for people they have the MRI scan and the MRI says that everything appears normal so you're wondering okay well what's going on here this then raises the possibility of what's known as a somatosensory hearing loss. What this is, is this is where something of the different structures of either the head, the jaw, or the neck, which feed into these systems is actually disrupted. Think of it like a, a transmission communication error. The nerves that are supplying these areas here in the neck, the jaw, wherever, they're going to coalesce into different centers of the brain. And as a consequence, that information is going to have a bit of a mismatch. And as a consequence, we start to experience abnormal symptoms, but the problem is not coming from there in the first place. And this can show up any number of different ways as far as the various cranial nerves are involved. Certainly one of the most sensitive one is going to be our hearing and also our balance because we as human beings, in order to stand upright, 
your brain has to process a huge amount of sensory information, specifically what's known as proprioception. It's your body's internal sense of awareness about where it is in open space. And you can appreciate that if your brain is receiving bad information from different kinds of structures, that can then cause a error where the brain doesn't know how to process this. And as a consequence, a person's going to start to be feeling vertigo-y, dizzy, sense of off balance, things like that. So in just a moment, I'm going to get into just to demonstrate how it is that different structures in the neck and the jaw can be involved with the sensory component here in terms of balance, equilibrium, hearing, ringing in the ears, different things like that. But I want to go back to the original question here where the comment was made about an inner ear problem being associated with the vertigo, but then also where, you know, the trigeminal nerve comes into play. The trigeminal nerve is going to be sensory for all of the stuff in and around the head, the face, also the inside of the cranial vault, and can be involved with various kinds of headaches, various kinds of migraines, sinus issues, things like that. My point being here is that these are actually two different nerves, and as a result, they're going to have two different pathways. Nevertheless, as I'm going to show you in just a moment, the centers of the brain are located very close to each other. So odds are, when people experience multiple symptoms, odds are you don't have two, three, five dozen different things wrong going on at the same time. Odds are that there is a common root problem that just so happens to be showing up multiple different ways. So this is going to be important, especially if a person experiences a, a balance issue and also if they experience headaches or neck pain. Odds are that there is a common denominator that is showing up and is affecting both the trigeminal system and also the vestibular system at the same time. So it's going to get a little bit complicated, but I'm going to try to make it as straightforward and simple so that you get the big idea, the takeaway message. Let's have a look at that. Okay, here is the start of your punishment. What I have here is a, a cross-sectional slice of a part of the brainstem known as the, the pons. The pons is essentially, it's the bridge between some of the, the vital life centers that are going to be located lower down in the brainstem, and then a relay station, if you would, towards the centers of the brain that are involved with cognition, sensory input, but then also balance and equilibrium. You don't need to know what all these itsy bitsy little dots are just to illustrate to you that, wow, there's a lot of stuff there. And it's this particular area that I've circled right here in the, the bright pink. You'd see that we've got one cluster here that I have annotated in 12, 13, 14. And then we have these two other ones just off to the side in 19 and then in 20. So let's start with 12, 13, and 14. These are what are collectively known as the trigeminal nuclei. So various branches of the nerves on the face, kind of like this, are going to coalesce into this primary processing center in your brain. The first one, so the N12, is what's known as a mesencephalic nucleus. This is something that a dentist is very aware of. This is what provides proprioceptive information from your teeth. Remember what we said, proprioceptive information goes toward being able to coordinate fine movements. In this particular way, if this center was ever disrupted, a person's going to be more likely to clench, to grind, maybe even chip their teeth. So very, very important. And also very important because, as you may appreciate, and as I talk about in a lot of other videos, a dental or a TMJ problem can manifest as a lot of different dizzy kinds of conditions. So disequilibrium, it can sometimes manifest as a vertigo. Most of the time, it's going to be that sense of off balance in a number of different degrees. What we also have here then is going to be the, pri uh, excuse me, the primary trigeminal nucleus. This is the sensory processing of the face itself. And then you also have this big one off to the side, N14. This is what's known as a spinal trigeminal nucleus. This is actually a cluster of cells that is contiguous, not just in the brainstem, but actually descends all the level to around C2, C3, C4 in the upper part of your neck. In other words, it's a pool that collects 
all of the sensory information about what's going on, not just in the head, but also of the neck. My point being here is that all of this information is dumped into the same primary processing centers. As a consequence, if a person ever has a disruption of the jaw or of their neck because they've had some kind of a physical injury, and even if it wasn't a new injury, you might be going well back into the past where you had a slip, a trip, a fall, a car accident, a sports injury, even a minor fender metal as slight as five miles an hour. If that causes a disruption from these structures here, that accumulative stress can start to add up over a long period of time. And what it does is essentially starts to rob your brain's bandwidth. Remember what we said, that your brain is always going to be processing huge amounts of proprioceptive information. Now granted, we're talking more about pain information here, but nevertheless, your brain, kind of like a supercomputer, if you were to have your own computer and you started just downloading stuff and videos and you're slowly over a period of time taking away all of the memory, guess what's going to happen? Your computer is going to start to slow down. It might even start to crash. Now, your brain not be, may not crash, per se, but what it does mean is if that bandwidth is slowly reducing over a period of time, it's more likely then that symptoms are going to start to pop up to the surface. And that can sometimes take months, years, or even decades following some kind of initial injury. And what do we do? We put it down to, ah, oh, it's just stress. Ah, oh, it's just me getting older. Oh, there's nothing that I can do about it. Well, again, have the test done first. See the audiologist, see the NT, see the ORL doctor to find out if you're dealing with an overt form of pathology. But if you're not, odds are you're having some kind of a functional neurological issue in that particular case. And that's where we have to take this stuff into account. Now, I also have right here the N19 and then the N20. These are going to be, relatively speaking, the cochlear nucleus and then the vestibular nuclei. This is what are going to be involved with hearing and also then the primary processing center that's going to coalesce information from your eyes, from your inner ear, and also from these joints in the jaw, in the neck that are laden with these proprioceptors that are going to go towards coordinating your sense of balance. Even though these are two different nerves and also two different pathways, have a look at that. They sit right next to each other in your brainstem. Therefore, if and where the brain is starting to accumulate and it's not able to process information, it's a hypothesis known as a disafferentation. Essentially, messages get crisscrossed and they start ending up in abnormal parts of the brain. And the brain is going to process information based on the input it receives. Garbage in, garbage out. And as a consequence, we can start to experience different symptoms in the body, even if that's not where the primary issue is coming from. Now, I'm going to relate this back to the neck. What does the neck have to do with all of this? How can this be involved? What I've got here, it's a giant model of the back of the head right here, and then you've got the top vertebra right there. It's called the C1 or the atlas, and then you've got the C2, aka the axis, which is going to be the attachment site for every muscle that goes up to your, well, not every muscle, but a whole bunch of muscles that go up to your head, down toward your shoulders, and ultimately forms a kinetic chain linking things all the way down that go to your lower back. And in particular, on each side, there are four very small muscles, which is known as suboccipital muscles. They're so small that they don't really seem to be involved with primary movement of the head, but what they serve as are balance organs. They're laden with what are known as muscle spindles. Muscle spindles are a specific kind of nerve receptor that are going to be involved with transmitting proprioceptive, that is, balance coordination information, up to your brain. To give you some kind of a perspective, these little muscles are going to have anywhere between about 100 up to around 250 spindles per gram of tissue versus a big muscle like your trap on the upper part of your neck, on the lower part of your neck, and on the top of your shoulder. That's going to have a grand total of two muscle spindles per gram of tissue. Point being that these are going to be super involved with sending sensory information up to the brain. 
There's also a cluster of cells located right here. It's known as the C2 dorsal root ganglion. Don't worry about any of these fancy names. Simply put, it's one of the biggest sources of sensory information from the back of the head and from the neck itself. So if and where we might ever have an issue with this particular area, this can be a major source of abnormal input going up to the brain. And that can be the very thing that starts to overload these sensory processing centers. So let's have a little look at how that happens. Okay, again, there's a lot of pathways, a lot of nerve centers in the brain. We don't need to hit on all that. But simply put, what I've wanted to illustrate for you ever so brief is that where I've illustrated the, the pink circle here, this corresponds with that exact same level that I showed you on the previous schematic with all of those different nerve centers there. And even though the little diagram here only shows nerve traffic going up one side of the brain, truth is, is that there's actually going to be both sides. It's just if we put arrows all over the place, then you can't really make sense of anything here. So blah, 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 even though you're seeing this pathway going Going up this side, truth is it's actually coming from the opposite side. This is what's known as the anterolateral system. This is going to be processing pain information and also temperature information that's going up to the brain. Also pressure, we'll add that in there as well. And what you can see there is that this is going to have direct connections with some of those trigeminal nuclei. This is the pathway that information is going to be going up to your brain and be going into that exact same system that's involved with the trigeminal nerve. Amongst the other functions of the trigeminal, it also coordinates how your jaw moves. So if you can have a problem in the neck, if it affects the primary processing centers, remember garbage in, garbage out, that can start to change the way that your jaw is moving. And this can lead to TMJ disorders. This can lead to abnormal dental issues. And this is the one of the important things I talk about often on the channel, why it is that it's important for what's known as a craniocervical specialist or an upper cervical chiropractor to work in conjunction with a dentist. Because people can have all kinds of issues through here. It can be coming from the jaw, and it can affect the neck. But it can also be the neck affecting the jaw, leading to any number of different pain symptoms associated with the head, neck, and the face. So that's the first piece. The second piece now, this is what's known as the posterior column medial lemniscal system. Really, really fancy way of saying proprioception. This is the one that's sending the joint position information, muscle tone, muscle tension, it's involved with posture to the various processing centers of the brain. It doesn't just go up to the top, it also goes to the parts of the brain known as the cerebellum, which are involved with fine motor coordination, things like this. And again, what we see is we see that there's an overlap in this particular area. This is one of the reasons why it is that a person, if we are looking at their posture, we can say, you know, there's an issue here and this can perhaps be contributing because if this is overloading the posture control centers of the body, this can lead to abnormal tight muscles anywhere. Not just the head, not just the neck, not just the shoulders, but potentially all the way down to the lower back as well. And last but certainly not least, the system, what's known as the medial longitudinal fasciculus. I don't make up these fancy names. My apologies again. You don't need to know what these names are. But in brief, we see again that there are going to be a variety of centers that are coming down originally from the neck, and they're going to coalesce in that exact same center of the brain that's involved with that sense of balance, with hearing, with that sense of coordination at that exact same level. And as we already said, if you have an overload of sensory information, that can accidentally spill over into different areas of the brain. And as a consequence, we can start to have balance issues, we can have vertigo, we can have brain fog, we can have craniofacial pain, we can have any number of symptoms. But the problem is not coming from there in the first place. It could be coming from the neck. So there we go, a little video on how it is that the neck can actually be influencing sensory things going on in the face, in the teeth, but also how this can contribute to balance disorders. If you are wondering here, why is this camera suddenly so shaky and why does it look different? Because while I was recording this video, my computer died just as we were getting ready to wrap up. C'est la vie. It's the way that this sometimes goes. Um, but again, I 
thoroughly appreciate the question because I know that if you've had this one question, odds are there's a number of other people out there who have the same kind of question. And I wish that it could be a straightforward, a simple answer. But as you can also see, there's a lot of moving pieces that get involved with this. So as a general rule of thumb, what would you want to do if you're experiencing severe pain in the face? If you're dealing with TMJ issue, if you're dealing with bad hearing issues, vertigo. First thing you want to do is you want to rule out pathology. So go to the audiologist, go to the ENT, have an MRI done, have proper testing done to find out if there is some kind of structural pathology, tumor, bleed, infection, or if you're dealing with that sensor and neural damage, because if that's the case, to a certain degree, it might require that medical intervention to help out. Now, if you've had those tests done and nope, that's not it then it's very possible what you're having is a somatosensory issue, in which case the joints in the jaw, the joints in the neck can be having a profound impact and producing symptoms in these parts of your body when in fact that's not where it's coming from in the first place. And this then is where a craniocervical specialist is able to help you out. What is that? Cranial cervical specialist is a certain kind of chiropractor, very different from general chiropractic and very different from other forms of healthcare. There's no drugs, no surgery, there's no twisting, no cracking, no popping of the neck. It's a procedure that involves a series of precise diagnostic tests to find out what's actually going on with the structure, the mobility, and the function of the joints in the upper neck and what then is going to be the most gentle, precise way in order to correct that so that you can restore that normal brain-body connection, that normal brain-body function in that way. So if you want some more information about this, please check out some of the other videos that we have on this YouTube channel. If you want more blog information, you can visit us at clearchirospokane.com. Or alternatively, if you're not in the eastern Washington or the, um, uh, the western, uh, western Idaho area, then reach out to the directory. So there's a directory which is known as UCC Near Me that's worth having a look at to see if you can find an upper cervical or a craniocervical specialist near you who might be able to help you out. So again, thanks for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please do click that like and subscribe button. If you've got any comments, questions, please do reach out to me. I'd be happy to have the, the conversation, put together a video just like this one here. Um, and also please do share this with your friends and family. That way, if you know somebody where you think that they would benefit from watching this, it can make a, a difference. I'd be happy to help out any capacity that I can. So again, thanks for watching. This is Dr. Jeff at Clear Chiropractic. Get well, live well, stay well. Till next time, take care. Bye-bye.